Faith Bible Church of San Francisco uh, prayer meeting. Um, before we begin our worship and, met, and quick uh, devotion, let's open up in prayer. Let's pray. Uh, Father God, we thank you, Lord, for today. We thank you, Lord, so much for this time that we're able to reserve to, to hear your word, to focus in, in worshiping you, and to pray for each other, Lord. We pray for our church, we pray for its members, and we just pray for this time, Lord. Thank you for putting it in our hearts, the desire, the fellowship, to worship, and the desire to, to get to know you more. We love you, Lord, and in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Amen. All right. Now we start off with our prayer. Ready, set, mommy. Amen. Amen. Dude! Okay. 
Give thanks. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Such a blessing. Um, for today's devotion, um, let's all turn our Bibles to uh, James chapter 4. We're going to be reading, I'm going to be reading 13 to 17. So that's James chapter 4, 13 to 17. And um, I'm going to read it and you guys can just follow along. <clears throat> so again, our, chap our verse today is found in James, the book of James. Chapter 4, 13 to 17. Um, all right, let's, uh, I'll be reading 13 here. <clears throat> Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills it, we will live uh, and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is a sin. May the Lord add his blessings upon the reading of his holy word. Um, let's pray. Father God, we love you, Lord, and we thank you, Lord, for this, for this time. We love you, Lord, so much for who you are. We love you, Lord, and we thank you, Lord, so much that through all these things, Lord, that you are the one that came down to build a relationship with us. And Father God, I just pray that our lives would always be centered in that reminder, in that truth. So Lord, I just pray for this time that we, as I share this devotion tonight, Lord, pray that it would glorify you and that it would touch the hearts of many. So we love you, Lord, and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So while I was doing my own devotions and while I was doing my own studies, um, I came across this passage. I was actually doing a study on the book of James and... You know, there's something about James that I just really found appealing to. And so I was just doing my own inter devotion and studies for myself. And this passage came up. And it just got me thinking specifically on verse 13. Right? Um, growing up, when I was younger, actually, I had this crazy idea of what it was like to be an adult. You know, when you're younger, when you're like Apollos' age, my son's age, or when I was like 12 or 13 or 16 or 18, I had this idea that I just want to be able to make my own choices. When you're young, you think you know everything <laughs> and, and you just think you know more than your parents do. And so what happens is you just start thinking, oh my goodness, I can't wait till like finally I'm able to make my own choices. You know, when you're younger, you really didn't have the option. You didn't really have the choices, right? You want to do something, but in the end, it always goes back to your, your parents, or in my case, my grandparents would actually make the final decision. You know, I want to go to this. I want to go to youth camp. I want to go to this. I want to hang out with my friends. And ultimately, I would just ask my parents or my grandparents, and they would just say, yes or no. I really didn't have the choice in the matter. That's why... When children are, you know, when, when, when children turn 18 and they're old enough, they want to leave the house and start making their own choices, making their own decisions. I didn't really notice how much good it was to actually, I didn't really, not good it was, I'm sorry. I didn't really notice how hard it was until I turned around 22 years old. Um, when I realized that I was actually being spared by all these extremely cumbersome and overwhelming choices. You know, most of these, um, most of the choices that I had to make once I became an adult, honestly, most of these choices were, were between something bad and something bad. It wasn't like a good choice and a bad choice. A lot of the choices that I was forced to make was choices that you just have to figure out which one wasn't so bad. Up until then, again, I didn't really realize how much swell I had it when my grandparents would help me make these choices, help me make the right decisions. Because when I was older, 
I have to make my own. And so when we talk about choices and we make about when we talk about decisions, I want to ask you guys a, a relatable questions. Questions that you feel like you've experienced at one point. So I want you guys to imagine, picture this, right? You're on your way to work. You wake up in the morning and you know exactly the right time that you need to leave your house in order for you to get to your commute to get to work. Imagine that, right? That's a, that's a very common everyday thing. Now what happens is, let's say half, like halfway through, halfway to work, you realize you left something in your house, right? It could be your, your driver's license, it could be an important paper, your homework, or some kind of report you needed to send, but something important and you left it in your house. You're stuck with a choice. Your choice is either you turn the car and come back home to pick up that important item, but you'll be late for work and you're gonna get in big trouble. And of course, because of this, you, you really need to be on time. Or you choose to just keep going and hopefully you can make do without that very important item. Again, you're dealing with two very difficult choices. Choices that you're like, oh my goodness, it's not, it's more like which one would cause the least amount of damage. Another one would be like, let's say if you're in college, right? Or you have a child who's in college and the choice is either put college on hold because I wanna make money now, I could work in this, in this field, I could become a mechanic and start off at a Pep Boys and maybe work my way up and who knows what, and, you could climb the corporate ladder, but just by starting immediately. Or the other choice is continue go to college, um, get more, you know, get more in debt, buy more books, and hopefully by the time you get your degree, it's still relevant four years later. You know, there's some really difficult choices that we all have to make. Um, another example that we had a few months ago, right before the vaccines, was you had a choice of either going back to work. Make money, but risk getting coronavirus. Or you could choose to stay home, be safe, but run the risk of losing your house, losing all the things that you worked hard for. These are some really, really hard choices. You know, I wish choices were like in TV shows or in movies where the choices are so simple, right? You know, there's a good choice and there's a bad choice. And in movies and in books and everything, you're like, of course, obviously, you're going to pick the good choices. But reality isn't that way. We're kind of just forced to make one decision after another. So in the past year, I myself have been making some really, really difficult choices. Some really tough decisions. Now, these decisions seem fine right now, but who knows what long-term ramifications will happen. Right? We've had choices where we're going to be working, what's going to happen, what was Apollo's schooling. Um, you know, one of the difficult choices that we had to make was actually last year, in the year 2019, around September, October time. Because it was a time where Apollo's, is, it was his last year of, of uh, preschool. And we had to choose between him going to, you know, him continuing this path because in his preschool, he actually goes to a really, really nice preschool. There was a lot of wealthy, influential people that was in his preschool. And in that preschool, it's like, it's amazing. Whenever we do play dates or whenever we're in like, you know, like exchanges or gatherings, it's kind of intimidating because a lot of the people that we talk to in preschools are CEOs or they're like surgeons and they were like judges and, and lawyers. And here we are, me and my wife are just preschool teachers. And it's just so intimidating, but that's the community that my son was in. And so me and my wife were thinking, oh my goodness, what is the right choice? Well, a lot of the families, some of the dads that I would talk to would urge me to say, keep your son in our community. Because if he stays within our community and he goes to similar schools than us, like go to these, 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 these um, wealthy private schools, then at least he'll be in that community. And who knows, one day your son might want to be a lawyer. And guess what? We have law firms. Your son might want to be a surgeon and they may have connections to, you know, hospitals. They have connections. And if my son stays within this group, the sky's the limit. 
But the problem with that is me and my wife, we're not, we're not wealthy at all. We're like the total opposite end of wealthy. And so we'd have to try to figure out finances and how we're gonna do that for my son. But the investment, the idea that my son could literally be anything he wants was there. Or the other choice is save money, have my son go to public school, but it's, it's gonna be in a very, very different community. You know, where the opportunities will not be as great, where the drive may not be as, as intense. And so that was the thing that me and my wife had to make choices for. And logically and rationally, you would look at the, the, the possibilities, whoa, so possibilities. If my son continued following this affluent, wealthy community, what's gonna happen is, of course, I just mentioned it earlier, connections with elite members of society, better offerings, better technology, brighter future, the schools have better funding. And this goes to our first part of the study of today's devotion, which is found in verse 13 of our passage. The passage tells us, I'll read it again, come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Now, the background to this in the book of James is the background in the book of James is you have James writing to the, the newly converted Jews to Christianity in Jerusalem. Right. So his, his crowd, his congregation that he's talking to are in more of the affluent situation. Again, in the earlier chapters, James was telling them, don't be biased. Just because a rich man comes into your congregation and you treat him better and you see a homeless man, don't treat that homeless man any different. Because that's the kind of congregation that they had in Jerusalem. It's about wealth, about affluence. Later on in the, the book of James, he talks about how, like, he would tell them, you know, work out your faith. Because they're so used to just relaxing and 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 just going on with the flow. Their money would just pay for these things. And then, of course, James would again urge them, go to action. And finally, in this passage, when he talks about this example in chapter 4, he uses an example that cuts deep into many of the people in this congregation. He says, to many of you who go, you know, who think of going to such and such a place and make profit there, he uses an example that everyone in the congregation would know about. The opportunity. The example of you think you know what's going to happen. You can plan out your world. You can plan out future planning. And you think you know exactly what's going to happen. That's kind of the congregation that James is talking to. And as co-readers of the book of James, living in the United States of America, the land of opportunity, it kind of, it really does relate to me. Coming from the Philippines, coming to America, seeing all the jobs and all this opportunity, it kind of, it, it really does pull a lot of the threads that makes me feel like, wow, this passage is relatable to us here right now. So yes, it's, it's really interesting that way. And so, <clears throat> it's really interesting, and that's part of the reasons why this passage reached out to me was specifically this idea of future planning and what will happen based on what I see. You know, one of my favorite genres of movies is films like, uh, like heist films, right? Like, like Ocean's Eleven, um, Mission Impossible, Italian Job. Those movies are where the main character would plan something out, like an intricate plan, and then they pull it off. Usually the plan is like this complex thing where the elevator has to move a certain way and when it hits the ninth floor, this happens and then this and you just have this chain reaction and all the plans work perfectly. Usually the, the person, the main character, um, whether it's Danny Ocean or, or you know, whoever it is, usually the main character is like usually very smart, witty, charming. You know, these stories really bolster our power fantasies. You know, the feeling that you have the power to make a plan and out of your pure, sheer will, you could make it happen. That really does appeal to, to all of us who has that power fantasy. Um, especially in a world where it's very chaotic. 
earlier I said I'm a preschool teacher and I could plan out my day, right? I could, I could think, I could have expectations for my day. I know there's going to be snack time. I know there's going to be this. I know there's going to be that. But because I'm a teacher, there's a lot of things that might, well, more often than not, there's a lot of things that could go wrong, right? A child could be sick. Um, on your way to work, the, your tire pops. All these random things that could happen that could really change your day, even though you came to that day knowing exactly, hoping exactly what to, what to accomplish. Well, that's what the whole idea of power fantasy is, is that you're in charge and everything works out well. You know, this is part of the reasons why I think Starbucks is so popular. Because with Starbucks, right, like, like imagine your day, it's so chaotic. You're going to work, you're commuting, you're red lights. Oh my goodness, I'm hitting all the red lights. And all this chaos. But that one moment of the day when you go to Starbucks to get your coffee, you're in line and the agent tells you, what would you like? And you say exactly what you want. I want a tall, non-fat macchiato with an extra shot of espresso with some cinnamon on top, right? Like you'd be very exact and precise in what you want to order in a coffee shop like at Starbucks. And then what happens next is you wait and then they call your name. You come up, you grab your cup, you take a sip and it's exactly what you ordered. It's like that experience because any other part of the day could be chaotic. You don't know what's going to happen, but at the very least, you had that moment of being able to just order the exact cup of coffee that you wanted. We find comfort in the feeling that we're in control. Yet, this control centers on your own will, right? what you want. Again, our passage starts off in a very relatable example. We expect our days to be the same and we make plans based on what we expect, based on the patterns that we see. In this passage, it doesn't talk about getting a cup of coffee, but future planning, a business venture with possible high yields, planning for the future. Back to my example with Apollos, that's exactly what I was doing. If Apollos went to this fancy school, he could be a lawyer and work at a law firm in San Francisco. If, uh, if it's through my will, Apollos will achieve what I expect from him. He will be a fancy lawyer or judge. And uh, if for some way he attains this expectation or somewhere similar to what I expect him to be, it is because of my foresight. It's because of my plans and it's because of my will. That's why I want him to go to this school. That's why I want him to do this because I expect greatness from him. Because I've invested this much money on him. And he has this many connections. You see, the heart or the inner man is a frequent topic found in the Bible. It is known as a center of oneself, the very core of a person. Our heart is who we are. The real me inside. Our hearts include not only to our personality, but our choices, our feelings, our decisions, our intentions, our motives. Proverbs 27 verse 1, actually, um, it's, it's similar to the passage we just read. In Proverbs 27 verse 1, it says, Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring. And then later on in that chapter, same chapter, Proverbs 27 verse 19, it talks about, As in water, face reflects face. So the heart of man reflects man. You know, our secular culture today um, encourages us to follow our hearts or that sometimes we need to get away to seek the truth in our hearts. However, it's not good advice because our hearts can easily deceive us. Instead of following or trusting our hearts, we should trust in the Lord and follow Him. In Proverbs 16, 25, it says, there's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. Proverbs 16, 25 warns us about our own rationale and where it will eventually take us. Yet also in Proverbs, we're also told that we can, ex we can escape this tragic path in Proverbs 3, 5 to 6. Trust in the Lord with all your hearts and lean not unto your own understanding and in all your ways submit to him and he shall make your path straight. 
So verse 13 in this passage highlights the idea of battle of wills. It's my will be done or the Lord's will be done. And um, one is sure to lead to destruction and the other leads to hope. The first part of our passage reminds us to keep things in perspective and in check. As believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, it is very much true to practice seeking out God's will first and foremost in all our decision making. We seek, like for me, whenever I make a decision, it's funny because I'm pretty sure a lot of you guys feel the same way or follow the same um, routine, right? When you're forced to make a tough decision, you usually seek your family's opinions, right? Oh, family, what do you think about this? And then after that, you accelerate, you know, you move to your friends. Friends, what do you think about this? And then you go to your coworkers, and then you go to Google, then you go to WebMD, and then you go to Instagram, and Facebook, and YouTube, and Discord, and Reddit, and forums, and your cousin's high school's best friend who works at Foot Locker. You talk to everyone you can talk to, and then once you finally made your decision, you bring it up to God, and ask him to bless it. Don't put the cart before the horse. Don't think of the second step before you make the first step. Pray to God and seek his will first. Even through these difficult times when we feel like we're faced with tough decisions after tough decisions, we must always turn first to the Father for guidance. With that frame in mind, we can then tune in, uh, we can then tune our will to be in sync with the Father's. And let's pray. Um, Father God, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you, Lord, for this short devotion. Um, thank you, Lord, for, for all the opportunities you bless us with. Lord. That even though we go through these tough decisions, and though it seems like we're making one hard decision after another, Lord, that we should always seek your will because when we find what is your will and our will is in sync with yours, we know that that is the right choice. Because we know, Lord, that you will always protect us, that you would always um, support us and give us comfort. And only through you, and only because of our trust in you, Lord, that we know that you take care of us. So, Father God, we just pray for this time. We pray for our members. We pray that there's a good, firm reminder of always following your will and always seeking out your guidance, Lord. We love you, Lord, so much. And we thank you again for this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.